I might just let, I can see that most people are, uh, are online already, so we might sort of get started while we're settling in and, and getting prepared. Um, thank you for joining us. We're really proud to release or launch our 10th report card. Um, it's quite a big day for us, um, having been around for that long and um, getting to look at the trends and things over time. So uh, we've had to go to a webinar to a virtual launch, unfortunately. We had a lot more planned and would have really liked to have um, all of the partners talk about some of their amazing projects. So thank you for volunteering. Um, I invited commas to, to talk at the launch that we had planned. Um, we'll come knocking on your shoulder at some stage soon to do a, an online webinar of some kind and still um, talk about those amazing stewardship stories moving forward. Today, um, we have a webinar set up rather than a Zoom that we're all used to doing. So you won't be able to, when you come in, um, as you've known, the microphone will be muted and we sort of have a control system here where we unmute you and so on. If you're having any issues, please just pop the little comment in the um, chat section um, and the team here will fix that for you um, or answer any questions as we go along. We do have a QA and a session um, after the report card results are presented as well. So there's opportunities to talk about the results um, and any of the finer points that you wanna bring up. So please ask those questions um, into the Q&A as you're going along. No one else will see them except the team. So don't worry about your spelling and stuff like that. Just ask away and we'll get back to you during that session. So this morning, we wanted to kind of have a bit of a reflection on our 10 year. Um, 10 years of existence or of reporting. We've got a few people in the room as well here and some um, amazing people to speak about that. Um, our science panel chair, Eva, will go through the results with you. Um, we'll have a Q&A session with our team here. Um, and then after that, we're going to talk about one of our big projects coming up, which is the Urban Water Stewardship Framework um, to sort of finish off today's proceedings. So thank you for joining us. Before we get started, I'm really honoured to welcome Malcolm Mann um, online, which is quite unusual, Malcolm, isn't it, for us, to do a welcome to country. Um, and we have Hayley Young here as well in the room, who's our FBA Indigenous Engagement Officer. So thank you, Malcolm. I'll let you take over your the microphone and Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Okay, no worries, sorry. I thought I might have been just talking to myself here. Um, this, these new times, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to um, welcome you here on our country, uh, on Darnable Country, and um, really want to acknowledge all the partners and uh, FBA in the work that you are all doing in this space. Um, so good on Molly, W to you all. Member Gu Dabal Nunthi. Member Gu Mundagara Nunthi. Mundagara is Antunaba, which is the river there on country. So um, it's a living, living thing. Um, for us as uh, Dabal people, it's more than just water. It's more than just, uh, it's a living being. And, um, and, um, I want to acknowledge um, it as a being today and use to under, understand that as well, that um, we communicate with this being every day um, through all our activities that we do. And uh, it's a big part of our belief system um, and how it's created our country and uh, how it connects us to the reef and surrounds. Um, so you got to Badambal Gumburu, which is um, respect to the Mole people, Badambal people and to um, traditional owners that are also on Mundagara as well, that are, um, that are neighbours, um, uh, part of that big song line that connects us to the reef there. So all traditional owners and uh, elders um, and yourselves as brothers and sisters, our siblings, they're connected to this, this big being here of Mundagara of Tunaba. So uh, on behalf of the Darnbal people, welcome. Thank you very much. Sorry, you're on, on mute, man. All good. Thank you so much, Malcolm. Really appreciate you. And I know you've got a really busy schedule, so and you've got to run. So thank you for your time, and we'll send you a report card as soon as we can. 
Um, thank you. And um, I know you might like to take a moment to just acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where you are today. Um, you may not be in Durumba like we are. So, Ali, did you want to say a few words or you're happy? Yeah. Um, we'd just like to also, we've included um, First Nations map in our new report card. Um, can you see that slide there? So um, I'd just like to invite Haley Young, who's our Indigenous Engagement Officer, who's worked with um, the team over the last few months to bring this map to you. And we're really proud of this. And Haley's going to explain a little more about that. So thank you, Haley. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, thanks, Lee. And it's for partnership for River Health. Um, I too, would like to acknowledge the First Nations of this country, the Durrumbul people, and particularly thank Malcolm um, for giving that welcome to country today. I'd also like to pay respect to my partner's family's country, acknowledging the Wadja, Gungalu Nation, and Gurungurung peoples. The Fitzroy Partnership for River Health and Fitzroy Basin Association recognise the diversity of First Nations. We acknowledge their important role as custodians of traditional knowledge and its deep history and we pay our respects to elders past and present. For those who don't know me, my name's Hayley Young. Um, as Lee mentioned, I'm the Indigenous Engagement Coordinator for the Fitzroy Basin Association and also support the Fitzroy Partnership for River Health. Um, my background's in cultural anthropology, community engagement and development and heritage management. As Lee mentioned, recently the Fitzroy Partnership for River Health led a exciting initiative to develop a stylized map of First Nations in the Fitzroy region for the purpose of providing a first point of orientation for their diverse audiences and partners. And it was my pleasure to lead their engagement process. As you can hopefully see on the screen, the map identifies the main waterways of the Fitzroy catchment and 16 First Nations. The native tidal landscape in central Queensland is evolving and presents challenges to several First Nations who need access to their lands to care for country. As such, the First Nations you see are represented only by registered cultural heritage bodies, cultural heritage parties, native tidal applicants, and native tidal prescribed body corporates. An intentional limitation of the map, as you can see, is the absence of boundaries. As such, this map does not purport to identify all First Nation groups in the region. And Fitzroy Partnership for River Health acknowledges that First Nations people do choose to identify with different tribal, clan or family group names that may not be recognised in this map. The engagement process was limited by a common constraint, a shorter than ideal time frame that did not allow for meaningful engagement with First Nation groups. This meant that there wasn't time for groups to consider the proposal or allow feedback via their normal meeting processes, nor did it allow for in-person consultation, which is the preferred and culturally appropriate process to ensure a free prior and informed consent process is achieved. In saying that, we did contact representatives from the 16 First Nation groups via email and numerous phone calls and received both positive and negative feedback. With a majority of positive responses uh, from the 16 First Nation groups, the decision was taken to move forward with publishing as a positive step to acknowledge the and recognize the First Nations in the region. The purpose of this map is hopefully twofold, to outline the First Nations that natural resource management organizations in central Queensland have a direct responsibility to, under both the federal native title legislation and also the Queensland state heritage legislation. And secondly, to promote awareness and encourage consultation between the Siku community and its First Nations. I invite the Fitzroy Partnership for River Health and its partners to support a network of positive, long-term and mutually beneficial relationships with First Nations. Indigenous knowledge and science can help us find many solutions to caring for country. Empowering First Nations to sustainably manage and heal their country will keep country strong for everyone to enjoy. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Haley. Thank you for the amazing work and support you've given us um, through that process as well. We're really proud of that. Um, we'll get things started, Dan, with you now. Dan Yates um, is the chair of the Fitzroy Partnership for River Health. 
um, and also the General Manager of Operations for M Mining. Dan, I'll hand over to you to sort of officially welcome everyone. Thanks, Lee. Um, hope I'm coming through clearly. Um, I'm out a little bit west of you guys at the moment. Just want to take a quick moment to thank everyone for their time um, for today and joining us um, as we uh, launch our 10th report card online due to COVID. Um, once again, um, we do appreciate not being together in person for the launch is a bit disappointing for us. Um, however, as they say, the show must go on. Um, so we trust you'll enjoy the next hour and a half as we celebrate the 10th report card launch. Um, and a quick thank you in advance um, for Malcolm um, and the welcome to country. Okay, so this is a, a bit of a roadmap um, diagram that we've done up um, and it just talks about some key milestones from 2008 through to 21. Um, really, it's about you know, why are we here? Now, after 10 years of reporting, I think it's a really good opportunity for us to have a think and remind ourselves how we came about and what is the, the core purpose of the partnership. So just in summary, the top left to bottom right, you know, in 2008, there was a fair bit of community concern around the water quality um, following the floods. Um, the government um, commissioned a report um, and, and the outcome of that report was a recommendation effectively to establish the partnership. Um, the role of the partnership was to facilitate improved monitoring in the region, um, to collate and assess data and information, and then publicly report on the waterway health. Um, and that's effectively what we've been doing for the last 10 years. Um, the information, the data that we gather, the information that we put out um, to the community does inform policy planning and resource management at both local, regional and state levels. Um, our first steward report, stewardship report was released this year, uh, has gone one step further to showcase the work being done as management response in the Fitzroy Basin um, to make sustainable change in water management by our partner organisations. Really proud of that. And as Lee said, looking forward to hearing more um, stewardship updates. Um, the partnership was the first regional report card to be established in Queensland. And it continues to play a crucial role in, in informing the community about their waterway health. Um, we continue to have a strong community support base and we do much more than just produce an annual report card. Um, if you haven't already been to the website, I would encourage you to do so. Um, or alternatively, get in touch with Lee um, or any of the team um, who can walk you through that. So as we said, today is about celebrating the release of our 10th report card. Um, and it's probably an understatement to say that that couldn't have happened without the contribution of our partner organisations who are up on the screen now. Um, thank you for joining us and thank you for supporting us. Um, I will note that we did cancel our water forum earlier. Um, and thank you to those who have set aside time and plan to speak at that forum. Um, we appreciate your commitment. Um, something we were looking forward to was the opportunity to catch up and share ideas, and we look forward to doing that soon. So we haven't given up on that. Um, we have also not cancelled the 10-year celebration dinner, okay? Um, we have postponed it. So, again, we will look forward to catching up. And it is important that we acknowledge and celebrate the successes and the 10th report card launch is a significant milestone that deserves celebrating. So we will do that. Um, the great thing about the partnership for me is its ability to evolve and adapt. And we look forward to hearing some of the more of those stewardship stories I spoke about just before and Lee spoke about in the near future. In addition to the ecosystem health report card, the other thing the partner do partnership does so well is bring the partners together and it's important that we share management actions that are above and beyond legislative requirements. Yeah. Our partners provide both direct investment as well as waterway health data to support report card development. We meet regularly and collaborate to ensure the very best outcomes for our region. 
In addition to the partners, we also welcome back the Central Highlands Regional Council to the group and, and applaud all our partners for their commitment. After 10 years of reporting, we still have many foundation members. And I think that's a testament to the great benefits of being involved in the partnership itself. So getting uh, funneling up from the partnership to the management committee, um, to all the people that are on this slide, thank you, my genuine thanks. Um, truly a dedicated group of people. We meet regularly um, to talk through um, our strategies and what we need to do. Um, and it's a fair bit of dedication and ongoing commitment that these people have shown. Um, the Fitzroy Partnership River Health really is a true partnership. Um, I've been involved for a good number of years now um, and all are equal in this group. It's a collaboration between organisations from the government, uh, industry, research and community who have all have an interest in the health of the waterway across the basin. Um, I value the involvement of each of you. Again, thank you. Um, today we celebrate our success as together we contribute to the ongoing monitoring and reporting of the health of the waterways for the basin. So it's pretty clear that a tremendous amount of work goes into compiling the report card each year um, and to provide, and that's to provide the central Queensland community with a more complete picture of their river health. Um, we can all be very proud of our 10th report card, which has once again improved on the previous years. Um, so thank you, Lee and the team and Eva and your team. Um, I commend the partnership on the release of the 10th report card for the basin. Um, and without me talking too much, I'd just like to hand over to Elise, um, who is the CEO of the Fitzroy Basin Association and our host. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. It's it's a bit strange in the room here, I have to say, because I've got everyone behind me, um, but I am talking to the screen. So I, I did a little bit, when Lee asked me to talk, um, I haven't been here since the very start of the Fitzroy Partnership, but I've certainly been here before the first report card, which um, is just as an amazing achievement. The, the first report card, I was part of some of those early conversations as a partners and I can remember being in a room and everyone, we came together with a common problem and together over the last 12 years, we've come up with an agreed shared solution for, how, for that common problem, which is developing a report card and sharing our knowledge about this catchment and the region. Uh, FBA is in such a privileged position to be not only a partner of such an amazing partnership, but also the host. So we get to do what not everyone else gets to do. We get to work with the team every day on sharing and telling those stories of all the amazing work that's happening across the region. So I just want to reflect for a couple of minutes and acknowledge a couple of key people from my memory. Um, so Susie Christensen, the inaugural CEO of FBA and some of those early conversations and the challenges of how do we bring all the partners together. I want to acknowledge Patrice um, in the room. I think Patrice, you and I have certainly been around for a long time in lots of the conversations. As the partners, the energy we have today around the room is just as great and the commitment and the passion for this region is amazing. And one of the things I think Lee wanted me to talk about was also some of the great work we're now starting to do. So um, you've probably, a lot of you will probably remember, there's been some ups and downs along the way about how we, do we host, do we go out as our own entity? How do we work as a team? I think we've got a pretty good balance happening now where we work really well. And I was looking through FBRH's uh, Facebook posts today, just as a little reflection of what's going on. And there's so many posts where it's part of the FBA team with part of the FBRH team supporting each other with other partners out and about. We're constantly supporting, backing each other up, telling all the stories about the great work that happens throughout this basin. And as, a, as an entity who's working in this basin, there are so many things that we're all doing to 
improve the health of the rivers and the land and to manage that land whilst also still eking out a living and being uh, using those resources responsibly. So um, well done to everyone. I am so looking forward to the 10 year celebration, Dan, and what we achieve next, because we should all be really, really, we should celebrate the greatness. It hasn't been easy along the way in, in working through this partnership. And I'm sure there'll be times where there's still the odd test of what do we do next and how do we stay relevant? And we haven't had a crisis for quite some time, but the partnership still has the same commitment. Everyone is still as committed. And that's a true testament, I think, to what we're trying to achieve. And it is a genuine partnership. So well done, everyone. Um, congratulations on 10 years. Congratulations on an amazing report card and a great team. They're all sitting behind here. Um, sorry that we had to do it as a hybrid event. Um, we're still getting used to these hybrid events. It's a great day here in Rocky. So sorry, guys on screen, you're missing out. Um, but I'm looking forward to hearing some of the more detailed results. Thanks, Lee. Thanks so much. Thanks, Elise. I'd just like to reaffirm that um, I think we're probably in the right spot. Um, yeah, we, we seem to work really well together and um, those collaborative opportunities are growing. And in fact, um, our partners are now coming, you know, to us um, here and there. Mel Ballantyne, I know you're online there um, with some projects that we can then help with and um, share with FBA as we move forward. So there's lots of great benefits. So thank you for your support as well. Um, and the training budget's pretty good. Nice. <laughs> but while we're reflecting on our last 10 years um, of being here, I guess 2008 was when um, the idea sort of first was born. Um, I'd like to, unfortunately, we couldn't have um, Emeritus Professor Barry Hart with us, but he was our first independent science panel chair um, for the partnership and was very involved in um, the report that was commissioned before that. So we have a nice video of Barry to play for you. Um, so I'll pop that on now. Fingers crossed that that goes okay. Brad, I'll hand over to you to do that. Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to say a few words today. Uh, I'm extremely sorry that I can't be there in person. Uh, before starting, uh, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the country upon uh, which we meet today. For me, in Ichuka, Victoria, it's Yorta Yorta, and uh, Durham Ball for you in Rockhampton. So I uh, pay my respects to past, present and future, and also recognise their continuing connection to the land, water and culture. The purpose uh, of, of my talk, I've been asked to provide a little bit of the history of the report card uh, from a science perspective uh, on, on this occasion of the launching of the, uh, the 10th Fitzroy re report card. So the independent uh, science panel, which I chaired, was established in 2010. The, um, the background to that was in 2008, I believe, there were major floods in the upper part of the Fitzroy catchment, uh, and in particular, uh, the Ensham uh, coal mine was, was flooded. Com considerable com community concern occurred. Um, a couple of months later, actually, the floods were in January. Um, we won't go into the details of that, but I was asked by the then uh, Premier, Anna Bly, if I would conduct an independent inquiry into uh, the flooding and the subsequent re response of both Ensham and uh, the government departments. Following uh, that report, uh, the latter part of 2008, uh, the Premier called for the establishment of an independent mechanism for reporting on the condition or the health of the Fitzroy system. And soon after this, that was in 2009, soon after that in 2010, um, the Fitzroy uh, Basin Authority established an independent science panel, and uh, it was established uh, with uh, the exuberant Nathan Johnson as our executive officer. The first science panel, um, uh, as I say, I uh, chaired that. Uh, the members, if I can go through very quickly, 
Uh, Dr. Eva Abal. Uh, Eva was at U University of Queensland. She's now the, the current chair. And uh, there's Leo Duvenboden, who was at uh, Central Queensland University. John Patton, who was uh, at that stage a principal scientist with the Department of uh, Environment and Resource Science. There was Britta Schafka, who was at Ames. Roger Shaw, who was CEO of uh, CRC for Coastal Zone uh, Estuary and Waterway Management. Uh, and uh, Dr. Sue Vink, who was and still is at University of Queensland. So the, the, the two main objectives that, um, that we were presented with was first to establish the Water Quality and Biological Monitoring Program. Um, and we did that using the advice of a report uh, that we received in 2011, uh, and uh, that was established. The second, second component was to develop an annual report card. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very exciting really to see the launching of the 10th of these today. The purpose of those report cards were really to provide the community, it was aimed at the community, the Fitzroy and wider community, uh, with a simple but robust and believable uh, report on the condition or the health of the Fitzroy River system. As part of the um, uh, that establishment of the report card, the development of the court board card, the science panel commissioned a technical review of ecosystem health report cards. There are a number of them around the, the country and there are more now. Uh, the one that we probably went closest to was the uh, Southeast Queensland Healthy Waterways report card, but there was one from Gippsland Lakes, Port Curtis, Paul Gra, up in Papua New Guinea, and so forth. Uh, and uh, Nicole Flint and her colleagues at uh, Queensland, uh, Central Queensland University undertook that review. We, we thanked them at the time. So the first report card was issued in uh, 2012 and it covered the years 2010 and 11. And subsequent to that, uh, the report card has been produced each year. That, that first report card was very heavily focused on water, qual water quality indicators, uh, salinity, dissolved oxygen, toxicants and nutrients. And that was basically because that was the information that was available. We, we had uh, uh, wished to, to have an ecosystem health uh, report card, but the, the amount of biological and ecological information was, was very poor at that stage. Over the years, there's been some uh, biological, ecological information. It's mostly based around macroinvertebrates, uh, insects, and that now features part of the, uh, the existing report card. Uh, one development that I'd really like to, to highlight was the development of a web-based information system by Luke Kohler. Um, I, I think that is still going in varying guises. In fact, I think there is now a My Waterway community portal, which has gone a bit further and, and has <coughs> components there for advising those who would like to get into citizen science and monitoring. But personally, I, I was very pleased, along with my colleagues, to start this process, the report card process, and, uh, and to make uh, information on the health of the Fitzroy more, more available and more understandable to, to the community. I've got to say, I, I was also very pleased that the FBA uh, honoured me by establishing a scholarship called the HART, with an E in it, uh, rather than H-A-R-T, scholarship at uh, CSU. Uh, that, that's, I, I'm really very proud of that. And there's been a number of uh, graduates who have uh, been able to graduate because of that scholarship. So uh, I'll, conclude, I'll conclude there and wish uh, everyone well for the day and, uh, and a happy launching of the 10th Fitzroy Report Card. Thanks again.
Thanks for that, um, Barry Harnes. I know he's not with us, and unfortunately, we can't see his video in the room here. So, um, see if we can sort of sneak over and behind Braden and have a look. But um, yeah, it's lovely to hear those words um, from right back in the beginning. And I just wanted to talk about a few things um, that we've sort of evolved to, as we keep saying, you know, over the last ten years before we move on to the official part of the day, which is the launching of the actual report card itself. Um, so that is our flagship product, of course. Um, and our main um, production, I suppose. But um, alongside that over time, as Barry mentioned, we have our My Water portal, um, but we also do a lot of community engagement. Um, and in fact, we have so many offers to do it that we have to sort of turn them down. So, um, you know, it's, it's dependent on time and resources, but um, we definitely go out at least once a month to a local school or community event and um, engage with, with people about waterway health and um, how to manage the waterways. Um, we've got our educational tools, our Mindy Barramundi. We couldn't get Mindy out today, unfortunately, but um, she's always a great hit. And of course, our big board game that we use. Um, so I guess there's three things that we think about in the team now is, you know, that reporting and the report cards. And with that comes that stewardship and management response reporting um, and the annual report and those sort of things. Um, but the most fun for us is engaging with the community um, and that, that side of it. And then, of course, um, our partners who we um, dearly adore, actually, and we've, we've got some great relationships with all of our partners now. Um, and I think providing that platform, unfortunately, we couldn't do that today to sort of get together and have a chat about what we're working on. Um, but I think the partnership has an increasing role in that, um, that diversity of bringing those groups together, which... You know, I really, from what I understand in the early days, um, it was, you know, there was a little friction in the room when we brought together some of those different partners and, and that's really evolved over time. So if nothing else, we've been able to bring those conversations together, which I think is amazing. Um, just one final little um, push, I suppose, for the My Water Portal. So we've really increased our branding around that citizen science space. Um, and as Barry mentioned, we do have that online portal where people can enter their data, girl guides and school groups and so on can do that. And they actually get a score for their little creek um, in their backyard if they want to. So um, this tool, we've got a new manual that's out, is um, just a wonderful tool to, to have and to use with community. So on to the official, um, the official uh, launch, I suppose. Um, we've got a couple of people to say welcome to us today um, and officially launch the um, report card itself. Then we'll hand over to Eva, um, waiting patiently online there to talk about all of those amazing results and tell us what the result was. Um, before we get started, we just we um, we obviously we work with all levels of government. Not obviously, but we're lucky to, um, and we do have a short video of welcome from um, the minister for the environment, Susan Lee, to play. We do have an apology from Minister Scanlon um, on the state level, who was trying to get a video to us, but her um, she was just very busy, um, unfortunately. So if we could just play Susan Lee's video, um, Brandon, that'd be wonderful. I'm Susan. Susan Lee, and I'd like to thank the traditional owners, tourism operators, farmers, fishers, scientists and communities who are working together to protect the Great Barrier Reef. Thank you. Your fantastic local actions are helping improve the water quality of the reef, helping to protect its delicate ecosystems and helping to improve local environments in the process. Measuring the health of our waterways helps us understand the condition of our regional catchments and their impact on the health of the reef. And that's why regional report cards are so important. They also demonstrate the value of your efforts, inform future decision making and inspire new projects. Thank you again for your efforts and congratulations on today's launch of your 2020 regional report card. Thank you, Minister Lowe, for, the, uh, for that. Um, it's lovely to have that acknowledgement from, from um, government. Um, about the work that we do and the work that we do in the reef space as well. And in, um, there are some of the other reef report card groups um, joining us today. So welcome to all of you, my, my colleagues. Um, it's probably the work that we do with the community um, and with local government that really has the most impact with our communities. Um, we're lucky to have Rocky Regional Council online as a partner for since the beginning. Um, and in fact, today, I'd like to introduce Councillor um, Donna Kirkland, who's going to um, say a few words. 
Um, thank you also, Jeffrey from Central Highlands, who's recently rejoined us after a little stint away. Um, so we'll be in touch to work more closely with you. But I'm really grateful to have Councillor Kirkland with us and to work with her um, on quite a regular basis. In fact, I'm quite comfortable now to give Donna a ring on the phone and just um, ask a quick question. And she's always very supportive of our events. So I'm going to welcome Councillor Kirkland. Uh, thank you, Lee. Thank you and welcome, everyone. In uh, 1861, the Rockhampton residence water supply actually came from the Yepin Lagoon. The Yepin Yepin, as it was known <laughs> back then. The water contained weeds, still does, and was so dirty that ashes and coal had to be added to settle the dirt. It was reported that some residents drank their water with a dash of brandy, uh, <laughs> lemon juice, or even vinegar. And uh, well, I for one, I don't know about everybody else here, I always speak for myself, I'm exceptionally glad that we have come a long way since then. I would like to acknowledge um, the FPRH team today, all of our partners, all of the doctors and all of the professors, and uh, certainly I also acknowledge the country on which I stand and the traditional landowners, the Durrumbul people, their elders past and present and emerging. Last year, Rockhampton Regional Council reached the 50-year milestone since the Fitzroy River Barrage was opened. And this year we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the commissioning of the Glenmore Water Treatment Plant that provides water to between 60 and 70,000 residents, taking water to some 32,000 properties across the region. Thanks to the 2008 Heart Report, reports actually stimulate actions, behavioural changes and directions and peace of mind. And uh, this have, we now have this fabulous report of the ongoing monitoring of our ecosystems for the community and all levels of government and industry to demonstrate the health of our waterways. I did have a little bit more about the 2008 Heart Report, but a couple of speakers before have spoken to that, so there's no <laughs> point going into it unless you weren't listening. I believe this is being recorded. You can play it back. And, and <laughs> Rockhampton Regional Council are committed. Now, Lee's actually asked me to talk to you about some of the things that Rocky Regional Council are doing in this space. We're committed to the ongoing stewardship and the good management of our environment and all things that influence its health both now and into the future. So our environmental sustainability strategy was the beginning of our deliberate journey toward ensuring the protection and enhancement of our region's natural environment and waterways. And I wanted to read to you something from that particular strategy. I'll show you there. If you haven't seen it, jump online and read it. But I did want to read to you from, from the beginning of that. The environment is all around us, from the air we breathe to the soil beneath our feet from the bush to our city streets, from our creeks to our mighty rivers and beyond. Our natural environment sustains us, providing access to clean water, air, food and shelter. It also underpins our economy, climate and the livability of our region. How we feel about this environment is often shaped by our understanding and connection with nature. Many of us, identify with specific sights and smells, sounds and experiences, like the smell of local trees in bloom, the sound of birds as you take a walk, the feeling of catching your first fish from the Fitzroy River, or the cool fresh air as you take in the views from Mount Archer. Protecting and maintaining this natural environment is essential if we want it to continue to support the livability and the prosperity of our region. I thought that that was particularly relevant to why we are all here today. Our environmental sustainer, uh, sorry, our RRC are thrilled to continue our involvement with the Drain Buddy program. Having also installed Gross Pollutant Trap recently, which is a fabulous educational tool. And that's what the report card is really about. It's about education. And we've seen the value of the, that Drain Buddy program and with the identifying of straws, et cetera, going into the, the drains, we've been able to talk to, 
to businesses located in those areas where the drain buddies were and they've changed their behaviour, they've changed the way they're doing things. So we've also co-funded with Livingston Shire Council and State Government and the Boomerang Alliance team a plastic free places education program and the Boomerang Alliance team are working currently within our local business community to again assist and educate on the transition to that plastics free. And if you didn't already know, most of you should know this, but if you didn't, we have our main waste facility and two sewage treatment plants right alongside the Fitzroy. As at the waste facility, very deliberate work has been done towards zero waste, with now 100% of bio waste being diverted from landfill and beneficially used in local activities, 100% of local green waste reused as mulch, 100% crushed uh, glass is now crushed and reused in construction and road surfacing activities. And we have a new landfill to gas arrangements moving towards that gas to generate energy supply by 2025. Currently, we are trialling curbside FOGO collections, which will again allow for food and organics to be diverted from the landfill next to the river. Fitzroy River Water have recently upgraded the South Rockhampton sewage treatment plant through the installation of a new aerating system and dedicated anoxic zones to improve the nitrogen removal. So approximately 1,000 kilograms uh, of reduction of that nitrogen going into the estuaries weekly, which is around 24, represents about 24% reduction annually. That's 11.7 tonnes not going into our estuaries. The establishment also of recycled water scheme and biosolids management has achieved 90% reduction in ammonia released from the South Rockhampton uh, sewage treatment plant into our estuaries. Council have recently committed a massive capital investment of $48 million over the next three years for the augmentation of the North Rockhampton sewage treatment plant. That will improve the plant's ability to remove phosphorus and reducing the release to the estuary of all those, of all those nutrients previously mentioned as well, and providing increased capacity to service our growth for the next 30 years. In addition, upgrades are being done to the Glenmore Water Treatment Plant, improving treatment processing, monitoring and controls, and that's a further $17.1 million commitment from local government. We have implemented target on-ground NRM works um, at 15 project sites, including significant wetlands and waterways, stabilising the riparian areas and improving biodiversity. We're continuing to deliver integrated flood hazard mapping, further developing a better understanding of our waterways and opportunities for flood mitigation. The flood, of course, is where we all began with this. Mm -hmm. We are a proud Reef Guardian Council member, and I couldn't be here today without boasting our title as winners of the Queensland Sustainable Community Tidy Town Award, and we're attending next week as finalists in the national awards. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that water will be the topic of the decade with the project delivery from Rookwood Weirs supporting agribusinesses and most likely Stanwell's hydrogen project, as well as demand for water throughout central Queensland increasing. Our own imminent needs for water security calling from the Mount Morgan community. Currently, we're undertaking feasibility studies for provision of a pipeline from Fitzroy of either potable or raw water to that community. We're also lobbying for the raising of the Eden Van Weir and our barrage to provide future regional water security as changing weather and residential growth will become, we become more vulnerable. Also supporting the need for ongoing water discussions is the Battle of Water Hyacinth, just one other of the many hazards from reduced water flow during longer dry spells. All of this emphasizing the need for continued monitoring of our waterways. This report card is very important resource. And on behalf of Rockhampton Regional Council, I wish to congratulate everyone and I welcome you all today for the launch of the 2019-2020 Fitzroy Partnership for River Health Report Card. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council. It's a wonderful way to start off our proceedings. Um, I look forward to what we will do with the water hyacinth. <laughs> it's an interesting space. 
Um, Eva, if you're ready to take over, I'd like to hand over to um, Associate Professor Eva Abal. We're so lucky to have you, Eva, as our Independent Science Chair. I really thank you for all of the work and support you give us. Um, Eva also heads up the River um, Foundation, the International River Foundation, and brings a lot of expertise and international national knowledge to our report card. So if I can hand over to you, Eva, for the results of the report card. Thanks, Lee. Um, can you all hear me okay? Okay. okay, so thanks Lee and likewise, um, I would like to echo what Dan has said. It is really um, a pleasure to work with you and your team um, in generating this report card. I would also like to echo Councillor Donna's statement that the report card is a very important communication tool. Uh, but before I, I go ahead, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathered today. I know we are um, all everywhere around and for me here in Brisbane, I would like to acknowledge the Jagara and the Turbal people. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Thank you very much. Um, before I talk about the key findings, see, I have to delay this. I was instructed then to delay and do like a kind of drum roll for this, you know, amazing result. So I do have a few people to thank for um, in, in, um, in terms of the effort in generating a report card. So a, rep a report card is not generated overnight, as we all know. So I probably would step back a little bit and, and think about a report card. We are very familiar with report cards. We've, we've had report cards when we went to school, right? So the report card is, as Barry has indicated, is really of the same principle, that it synthesizes um, information over a period of time. And in our report cards, it's like in a term, so, and it, it is generated by a number of um, indicators or results. So it can be like in the case of a school report card, oral, you know, reports, or in the case of, you know, oral reports or homeworks or quizzes or long exams and so on and so forth. And that's the same structure as a report card. And, but we know that a teacher, um, it's a lot of effort for the teacher to generate a report card. It's not an overnight thing. So there's quizzes to, to mark, um, observations in the class and so on and so forth. So the ecosystem health report card and the report card that we are going to, to present today and in the past 10 years, it's nothing, it's not, nothing different. It, it's very similar in terms of approach. The communication aspect as highlighted by Councillor Donna has, has to be highlighted on this one too. The reason why a teacher takes time to generate a report card is that in front of the in front of the parent, the, the child can go back to the parent and say, "Okay, here's my report card. It's just one piece of paper," but that actually synthesizes a lot of information through the term, right? So, but before I go on and talk about passionately about report card, Lee knows and Barry knows how passionate I am with the report card, having been involved in the first ever report card that was released in Southeast Queensland. I think that was back then, if I tell you when, then you'll, you'll realize I'm quite old then. So that was back then in 1998 that we re first released the, the Ecosystem Health Report Card for uh, Brisbane River and Moreton Bay. So um, let me talk about the Independent Science Panel first, because the Independent Science Panel, I'm, I'm actually very honored and privileged to chair such an esteemed group of, of um, colleagues. So we ensure not only the validity of the report card, but we also ensure that the, the process in generating the grades and the scores is actually independent. And that's very important because I'll talk more about how the data for the Fitzroy is actually um, gathered and collated together later on. So in a nutshell, the panel provides independent, comprehensive, unbiased scientific advice to the Fitzroy Partnership for River Health. But we also give an oversight of the synthesis, the analysis and the reporting activities to ensure that the data is analyzed in a scientifically robust, practical, and meets the contemporary scientific standards. Most of, most of all, uh, sorry, most of the data uh, that is um, collated in the form of the report card are provided by our partners. So I would like to acknowledge the partners for this, as well as third party monitoring agencies. And on behalf of the science panel, we are very grateful to the data providers. So I am humbled, as I said, and privileged to chair a group of colleagues. And let me introduce, some of them are present with us today. Dr. Roger Shaw, Dr. Sue Vink, Dr. John Platten, Associate Professor Helen Stratton, Dr. Barbara Robson, Associate Professor Nicole Flint, 
And of course, our very most important scientific coordinator for the panel, Cassie Jones, Catherine Jones. And, and I will call on Cassie later on to, um, well, help me out with answering some of the questions. Cassie and Braden did most of the analyses and interrogation. And, and mainly, I think the work they've put in, in terms of synthesizing the data so that the panel is able to scrutinize the data in a more um, organized way and systematic way is very much appreciated. So thank you, Cassie and Braden, for doing this. So before we look at the grades, I uh, would like, once again, I have to build anticipation here. Is that right, Lee? Let me step back to the first ever report card first that was released in Southeast Queensland. As I said before, you, you could compare it with a, with, a, with a school report card. Let's step back and think about what a report card does to us as a community as a whole, right? Synthesizes information. So the information that is presented to you comes from numerous data points, numerous sites condensed into that very um, powerful but simplified way of a grade or a score. As Councillor Donna has said, it's a communication tool. So we invite all of you to, to share the results that you find, especially the website, share that with your colleagues and Lee and, his co and um, her team are bringing this out into the community as well, as well as the school. It's a very easy to understand um, process of science communication. The next one, which is very critical for report card is about leveraging for management actions. So that's why it highlights where the hotspots are. It highlights where the waterways are doing well. And it's really an important basis for management intervention. And that's how a report card becomes very strong and powerful. We have to recognize that the implementation of management actions, especially along waterways, entails partnership. And hence the role of the Fitzroy partnership is very critical as well as working directly with Elise's group in terms of the FBA is very critical. So I'd like to say, think about it as a synthesis communication, leveraging management interventions, but also a very strong basis for partnership and collaboration. Lee highlighted that the Ecosystem Health Index Report Card is a flagship product of the partnership and, and we are very proud of that um, together with, with the other partners. So we have for you today a printed report card. I mean, Lee has it there. We also have it online. We will present it online, but it will also be um, on the website, on the web page that Lee has been referring to. Can I please encourage all of you to go onto the website after this, interrogate the, the results. You can actually go down finer detail when you click on the grades there, go through that and examine each of the catchments, especially the ones that are of interest to you. And then it will also give you some, um, some information on what lies behind the grade that we will be presenting today. So first of all, the report card results um, measures different parameters, physical, chemical, physical, chemical. It measures nutrients, toxicants, ecology, mainly fish and macroinvertebrates. And in the estuarine marine zone, it also includes a reporting for fish. And like a school report card, you have, you know, from an A, excellent, to a E, which is a fail. And in between, you have the B, the Cs, and the Ds. C is fair, D is poor, and then E is, e is fail. And how do we base this? This is actually based on what we call as water quality objectives. These are objectives that are set for particular waterways. In the same way, in a school report card, you have a passing grade, and that's what water quality objectives are. And water quality objectives are grounded to environmental values, which means these are community-driven values um, on a particular waterway. So for example, if a community wants to be able to access the waterway for swimming, that is actually, a, there's a set water quality objective for that. In the same way, if we want to protect aquatic ecosystem health, then that's the water quality objectives I set off, I set up for that. In addition, I think this is the second year now, we've also presented confidence rating, which really in a nutshell will tell you in summary, how good are the grades and, and, and confidence in a grade will, will be based on a number of indicators such as, you know, the, the type of methodology or the maturity of the method, methodology that is being used in the generation of the grade, the validation of that grade in terms of on ground 
monitoring the representative of that in terms of that particular area. So for example, in some, in some rivers, we only have one site versus five sites. And the directness, the direct link of that grade or, or that data to ecosystem health, or do we actually have, is it an indirect rating? And then um, the likelihood of any measurement errors associated with that parameter. So we've got that confidence rating and it's actually from very low to very high, of course, it's self-explanatory, very high confidence means that it's very representative of that um, waterway that it's being represented. All right, next slide. We have to do drum roll here now, Lee. Um, or Brayden. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Overall, we have a high C grade. It's slightly down from a low B in 2018 19. And we'll go through some of the discussions in relation to that slight decrease. But, you know, um, and I'll also talk about the trend of, of, um, of the report cards through the 10 years. So it's really a, an honor to be presenting the 10th year. Um, 10th report card, 10th year report card. Um, but it's interesting to note that that same score is similar to the score that we got in the first ever report card that Barry talked about, which was the report card for 2010, 2011. Um, let me step back first and, and, and refer you to the front cover. Um, I hope all of you, and I say all, not most, all of you would love the cover, right? It is a montage or a collage of, of a suite of photos that was actually a competition from a competition held um, earlier this year by the partnership. And that's what you get. I think it's a truly, ref, it's a good reflection of the different aspects of Fitzroy. And um, that's what you have there. It's, it's an amazing photo. I hope you all agree, yeah? Okay, so from a C, let me go to the de in detail to the base and wide grading and, um, as I said, it is my pleasure to present the 2019-2020 report card results to you, our partners and the community. So more details of the actual report card, as I mentioned, are also on the website. Please, please, as I, again, I would like to encourage you to interrogate the, the, the various results on the website. But let me, let me give you just the highlights, okay? So overall, Fitzroy Basin Waterways incorporating 11 catchments and the S tree slightly decreased from a low B to a high C. So just a slight decrease. By the way, a C means that for aquatic ecosystem health, waterways across the basin are in fair or to good condition. So catchment grades this year can be attributed in part to rainfall, which was again below average this year. So catchment condition and rainfall levels and the intensity of rainfall do impact water quality. So erosion and runoff can negatively impact water quality, especially during flooding years. But in times of below average rainfall, sometimes the lack of flushing can actually keep pollutants in the stream, causing water quality issues and hence affecting the grades. So in 2019-2020, the condition scores for Connors and Fitzroy decreased from a B to a C hence a slight decline in the overall report card rating for Fitzroy. The lower Isaac, Upper Dawson and Estuary retained a B good grade, so similar. And the Mackenzie, Upper Isaac, Calide, Lower Dawson, Nagoa, and the Teresa maintained their fair C grade. So let's talk about trends. And in the report card, you will see trends. In the lower bottom right hand of the report card, you will see a trend and it tracks the 10 years. So it's a recognition that we've done. And I say the royal we here, because it's a, it's, a, it's a collaborative effort of everyone here that we, we should be very proud that we have done 10 years worth of aquatic ecosystem health reporting for the Fitzroy Basin. But more importantly, Fitzroy has maintained a grade of from fair to good. So it, it fluctuates between B and C. So roughly it's fair to good, right? So our waterway scored slightly higher during the years between 2013 to 2016 and have decreased slightly back to earlier levels after that. So as we said before, reporting incorporates data from both normal weather events, as well as those significantly abnormal weather events, including major floods and droughts that have occurred in the basin over the preceding years. And, um, and once again, in the report card here, you'll see that we've put in, um, the, the confidence rating, but you'll also, also see arrows in terms of increase, decrease, or remain the same. 
So our data set is strong, but we continue to have gaps in some of our catchments with indicators. So, and we are very excited and heartened by the news that the new regional REMP, Receiving Environment Monitoring Program, will proceed in 2021. And, and we look forward to supporting the work of the partnership as we gain more comprehensive data to report to the community on water, waterway health in the Fitzroy Basin. So REMP is Regional Environment, Receiving Environment Monitoring Program. And we'll talk more about that um, later on. If you have any questions, we can talk about that. So in addition to that, in the actual report card um, document, you will see that we have um, synthesized the drivers, pressures, and impacts in the Fitzroy. And Braden, can you go to the next slide, please, which shows the conceptual diagram? This one. So this is a conceptual diagram that aims to, um, to, to synthesize drivers, pressures, and impacts in the Fitzroy um, basin system. So the main drivers are there and the drivers include, for example, rainfall, ground cover, land use, hydrology, land clearing, both uh, usually historical, historical or legacy and dredging. Pressures include activities in the catchment, agricultural industry and urban development. And basically this diagram shows the link, um, the links of these different pressures and drivers um, in terms of our waterway um, health. And while it is great to see that the system is resilient, we talked about this before that, you know, the grading of the, of the basin or the waterways in the basin are on the average B to C and it's maintained that fair to good rating. We have to, we have, we should not be very, we should not be always complacent because um, if you look at the top, the top uh, right hand side there in terms of climate, in terms of pressure is climate change. While it is great to see the system resilient, we have to be aware that a key pressure of climate change, we have to be cognizant of climate change, and what, is, what, what does it cause? Increased incidence and high, of high intensity cyclones, as well as floods, as well as periods of drought. So we, we talk about very peak flows, could have a very high impact on our waterways. Why? Sometimes, or in most cases, we have still nutrients and sediments being deposited in our catchments, actually being ready to, to be uh, carried by high rainfall event to the waterways. And it is very important to ensure that we prepare our catchments for these events. That means we ensure that, that soils and sed sediments in, soil, uh, in soils and nutrients in soils stay on land and they do not get flushed out into our waterways. In some cases, they believe that a very strong flood is good because it flushes our waterways down, down to the, um, down to the um, bigger body of water receiving water. But we have to remember that, um, and I know the minister talked about this, we do, we do have a very special asset in terms of the Great Barrier Reef outside our catchments, uh, downstream of our catchments too. So we need to ensure that we, we also protect our assets, our waterways and the, and the, and the reef in terms of sediments and nutrients. I think the message that I would like to finish with in this is that it is important to build the resilience of our waterways catchments. And because a lot of our communities and economies actually depend on our waterways and catchments. And hence, if we have resilient waterways, resilient catchments, we will have resilient communities and resilient economies. So with that, um, can I finish with that conceptual diagram and encourage you to use the conceptual diagram as an educational tool for the community and school groups. So to finish up, once again, I would like to commend all partners. I would like to acknowledge Dan. Dan, it is such a, a pleasure to be working with you and your team and um, the other members of the management team. I would like to acknowledge the members of the independent science panel, but more importantly, I would like to acknowledge Lee and your team. Uh, you actually have done this in a very fantastic and enjoyable way. Um, I could, every time we meet, I could, I could observe the passion in the team. Thank you for that. Thank you for um, Cassie, your hard work. I know with your um, 
immense, uh, immensely busy schedule in the university, you still put in so much time in collating the information and you actually make the work of the panel members and especially me very easy. Thank you for that. And Braden, thank you for capturing our um, discussions. I know we sometimes go in different directions in our discussions and that what's, that's what science panel is all about, but thank you for capturing that and also um, also reminding me regularly that we are about to have a meeting soon and we need to look at the agenda and, and you know, focus, focus the team. Um, I think, what did Barry say? It's been 10 years and I have had the pleasure of, of having been involved in the Fitzroy um, Independent Science Panel with Barry from the very start. I could not believe it's been 10 years because you know why? It has been such a pleasure and so much fun. And it is indeed an honor to chair the science panel on your behalf. Thank you very much, Lee. I will now hand over back to you. Thank you so much, Eva. Um, and thanks for going through the results. Um, I was going to play a short animation video and our second screen in here, for those of you online, it won't affect you too much has just come back up as the RT person walked in, I think. So we're, um, we're just, um, we probably won't play the video um, for us in here. We'll just give us a moment to have a look at the, the Q&A. So next um, session we'll have, um, I'm sure you've got some questions or some things that you'd like to um, ask about the results themselves. Um, we've got the team here ready to ask some of those questions. So while we do that, we'll play the video for you online um, and then we'll come back in a moment. Um, it's only sort of 30 seconds or so long. It just gives a really great summary of the results themselves. Um, and um, Nicole um, Dendel, who's sitting up the back there, you can sort of see her point actually. Um, thanks, Nicole, I can shake your hand virtually. Um, Nicole Dendel, our comms and engagement officer, um, who's done an incredible job to bring all of this together. She'll be um, presenting that on social media this afternoon. So if you want to share that on your partnership um, platforms, that would be um, probably a great way to do that. Um, we'll let you play that, Brayden, and then um, we'll come back in just a moment. from um, the audience. Not sure how to go about this. I mean, if we're just, um, can we hear you, Braden, if you speak, is there anything that's come up that, that you can read out and let us know? Anyone in the room got anything they'd like to ask at all? It was just breaking a bit, Lee. Was it? Yeah, we do have a microphone yeah. system in here. Um, and it might be not as sensitive to that little spot over there where we've got Patrice. But um, yeah, Patrice was just asking about the confidence level, level Eva, and I might throw to Cassie, who's in the room here. Um, just interestingly, that the two Bs that we received did have a lower confidence than the C grades, which is probably um, a coincidence. I don't know, probably not. Um, Cassie, would you like to respond to that? 
Um, question from the sure, sure, certainly. Sorry about that, Cobb. Um, so I guess, yeah, overall, why aren't we confident in some of the results? And this goes back to some of the things that Barry and Eva have mentioned, that the, the grades are determined using data that's provided to the partnership. And like, this is amazing because there's now 10 years of each year, I think we get about 500,000 data points. So as you can understand, that is an amazing amount of data. But the exact sampling locations and the number of sites and the number of sampling events and, and frequency of sampling during both high and low flow is very variable um, from year to year and from subcatchment to subcatchment. So to score a, a very high, to get five dots for confidence, that means that we have data from at least five sites uh, during both high flow and low flow events. So unfortunately, just um, as the, uh, the current monitoring, it is uh, not as concentrated in all of the areas. So some of the catchments, we are a little bit less confident that the results are as reflective of ecosystem health as we would like them to be. Yeah, but this is a great sort of segue into the new regional rep, uh, reporting program that I understand is starting sometime soon. So with the advent of that new monitoring program, there'll be a lot more representative data, robust reporting into the future, which is really exciting. Does that answer that, Patrice? It does, uh, thank you. Thanks, yeah. Kathy, thanks. It's interesting when you go through watching that process at the science panel and, um, you know, and then obviously management committee looking at it as well, but um, yeah, the confidence has really added an extra layer, I think, to that, to that data, which is great. Other questions, Braden? Is there... Yeah, we've got a question here from Tim Kendrick. So he said, do we use opportunities, do we see opportunities to use new innovations in sampling approach, such as the use of eDNA to improve confidence in sampling across the place? That's a great question, Tim. Thank you for that. Who'd like to answer that? Um, I could respond first, Lee, if that's okay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. So um, that, that's actually a very good question because um, monitoring has to be accompanied by the science, right? So the, 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 or research. So research behind monitoring is very important and innovation behind monitoring is as important for two, per, for two reasons. I think it's to increase the confidence. And I think Patrice's question about, you know, um, was there a trade-off in terms of the number of sites versus the confidence? Of course, there will always be that sites, as, as um, Cassie has indicated, with more um, monitoring points will, of course, um, have a higher confidence. But by the way, more monitoring points do not necessarily mean a high score. And we've had an example of that um, in, in one of the waterways in Southeast Queensland, where uh, the local stakeholders felt that there was not enough number of sites. So they wanted to double the number of sites and we doubled the number of sites. But then it then becomes, gives us a true reflection of the grade of the waterway. That means the score wasn't as high because it now is a better representation of the waterway, right? So it's better data, but not necessarily higher score is the, is the message in terms of, you know, enhancing the number of sites. With a question on innovation, there is a number of, there are already a number of technologies that could be implemented to make life easier for, for us monitoring the waterways. Most of these are still in the testing stage. And I know eDNA would be fascinating in, in terms of tracking um, you know, the results better. In the long run, it, when it becomes more, how do I say that, mainstream, it would then be converted into a monitoring tool rather than a science tool. Um, at the moment, uh, techniques like that we could use where there's a hotspot you know, when we want to focus on a particular site just to confirm particular results, that that's probably how it will be useful. The dream, I think, for monitoring, and I've always heard this, whether it's in the in the reef monitoring or it's in the SEQ monitoring or in the other catchments, it really is to do a tandem um, technique um, testing together with the ongoing monitoring, so that then we could look at where we could save in terms of monitoring. Because then we could, um, you know, remote sensing is a classic one that we could look at. Um, artificial intelligence, for example, is another one. To, to, to basically mirror the existing monitoring 
um, program first with innov innovative technologies. And in the long run, the innovative technologies can become mainstream. At the moment, I think we are still um, reverting to the traditional way of, of monitoring water quality, whether it's through nutrient analyses or nutrient sampling or through the macro invertebrates, invert, invertebrate sampling. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't be discarding that because what we have is 10 years worth of data. And that's very, more, that's, more, that's very important because that means that this is data that can be comparable on a year to year basis and, and data that we could then look at in terms of trend analysis, which I think Cassie, we, we need to highlight and Lee that there will be a 10 year analysis of data that, that the science panel has endorsed. And um, we would like to, it's more a, a systematic uh, scientific um, analysis of the data so far, looking at that 10 year trend of data. And having that 10 years worth of data, thanks to our partners and the third party providers is extremely important and in, in allowing us to be able to do that. Thanks, Eva. Hopefully that answers that question, Tim. Any others? Um, yeah, <clears throat> sorry. Um, there is another question here uh, from Michael Murray and it sort of leads on from that question. So he's, he's asking, could we stretch um, reporting to a longer interview, that's an interview interval. So there's 10 years of data and, and uh, the variation in the grades is uh, pretty small from year to year. So could you stretch that out to a, a longer reporting period? Um, so we will be around for another 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not every 10 years. I suppose just to um, reinforce what, what, mm. what Eva was um, talking about there, we, we do have the 10 years of grades now but now it's time to investigate but what's what's driving those grades and to start to delve down into that nitty gritty detail and to review all the data. So all the results of the last 10 years, both um, univariate, multivariate analysis and to better understand any patterns uh, or relationships. So with rainfall, with season, things that we know are the broad drivers, but to have a, a very detailed statistical understanding with this unique 10 years of river basin monitoring data. So we're in a very good position moving forward to improve the reporting products. I think, yeah, and I'd just like to add to that. I think um, there has been a little talk um, within the regional report card network and the wider network itself about um, reporting every two years, for example. I think we have to take um, that from, we have to take our advice from the community really. And I think um, doing it every two years is not necessarily gonna make less work for us. Um, and the trends will still be there. Um, and that overall grade um, really is a communication tool. So even though it's a C or a B, when you really go down into, say, just looking at dissolved nitrogen, it's not, not the same story at all. It's quite glitchy in the graph, if that makes sense in a simple term. So, um, yeah, I think we would be missing out on that longer-term trend and the actual parameters and water quality itself. Um, sure, the grade overall mightn't change much, but we have to keep that with a bit of a grain of salt, I suppose, what that means overall. Eva, did you want to add to that? I, I, um, I totally agree. Um, as, as I indicated, I think, before, there are several... Um, purposes or, or objectives of releasing a report card. And the first and foremost, it, it is a communication tool, but it has to be a robust communication tool. And that's what, you know, as, as Cass has indicated, half a million worth of data points have been used to generate this report card. Um, we, we, you know, we, we, could, we will always need more. And Lee, you've heard us say this before, and more data, especially um, across some of the parameters that are not measured as much like um, aquatic health, for example, that we need to have a look at. Um, so it's a communication tool, and I think it's a community engagement tool. And whilst we might not see lots of variation, it's still it's still a good way to to reach out to the community and, and celebrate. I think I think a report card is a way of celebrating. Um, and we talked about this, especially in the ten year celebration, Lee, that we talked about this. So I I. And I think on behalf of the panel, we've talked about this, we support, and I've heard it in other report card groups as well, that we support annual reporting in terms of um, the condition of waterways. Um, and, but then looking at deeper, you know, longer term type of trend analyses, um, uh, correlation type of analysis that Cassie was talking about, you know, do it in every five years or every 10 years um, worth of, of um, data 
which which I think we will we we have a work plan for that. And as soon as we get that deeper understanding and correlation analysis of the ten years worth of data, we will be working with Lee and her team and Dan and the management committee of when we can then release that. Thanks, Eva. I had a uh, question that I saw there before about um, there's a potential partner online, Dan Yates. This is a question for you. Um, why would they want to join um, and how much it costs? I can probably get in touch with them about um, membership fees and so on, but you might want to give a, a quick summary about why you think it's important for them to join, Dan. <laughs> I suppose my question would be why would you not want to join? <laughs> okay, so, look, um, a great opportunity to join with lots of different organisations and, and sitting in at the front of all those organisations are people. So people have a lot of different experience from across a lot of different industry, um, academia, the university, um, Fitzroy Basin Association. I think you know, if, you're, if you're interested in water health, um, if you're interested in the environment, um, join. Um, it's, it's very little cost. Lee can hook you up on the, on the pricing and whatnot, but... Um, I've enjoyed it. Um, I don't have an environmental background in terms of qualifications and whatnot. I just care. So if you care about it, join. Have a Thanks, voice. Sam. And you're always happy for a phone call, aren't you? More details. Yep. I'm sorry. happy to provide yeah. Lee's phone number anytime you want. I'm <laughs> <laughs> oh, just joking. Yes, you can provide my number. Any other questions online that, that I've missed? Um, yeah, so Jamie just also is touching on that the same, uh, looking into the trends and uh, perhaps suggesting it could be beneficial to put the corresponding pressures as part of the report card. And I think for sure, as we go on and we do these planned um, reports on the 10 years of data, we will have a much uh, more confident understanding of the specific pressures. And I think they're already starting to be included with that advent of the uh, conceptual diagram. Thanks, Cassie. Yeah, and I think the regional ramp as well really addresses that point, um, which is that new program we're working on where um, we're looking at particular areas that we're not currently um, looking at in great detail as well. So um, we're going to have a look at those um, impacts and pressures a little more. I mean, once we started clearing the land, you know, when Europeans settled here, I think the major damage was done. Um, for, and I was talking to the media this morning about, um, you know, how do we raise the grade? Um, it's it's not that simple. We don't, you know, we can't just get an A with the way the systems are. And I think part of that review process will address some of those um, bigger kind of burning questions. And uh, um, my message to them this morning was, um, it's not really about that. It's about the fact that we have this amazing independent monitoring program now um, that's occurring right across the basin and how lucky we are to know then that there's confidence in, in what's occurring in the basin. And the fact that it hasn't shifted much really indicates to me that the management processes and the policies and the regulation is working well. We haven't declined despite it being busier and, and um, being much, you know, a lot going on in the basin over, the, over time. So um, that to me is a good news story. Um, any more last questions because sort of we might finish off and- There's no more online. Nothing else in the room today, Jason, yes. I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the detail, perhaps, but um, yeah. more a comment, perhaps, and a question. It's really, really pleasing to see that over the 10 years, estuary has gone really in quite a, a very strong positive direction. That's true. Um, you know, it, it's hard to know exactly why that is, given the various major flood events and so on and so forth. But um, given that overall population growth has continued, in mm. this urban mm. footprint. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's actually a very positive result. Uh, I'd be curious to get into the detail once I have a closer look and see um, what some of the contributing factors to the slight decrease were in terms of the actual data. Mm. Um, but I think that's a really excellent trend and hopefully that will continue into the future. Yeah, thanks, Jason. That's a good comment. And in fact, the media asked us this morning about that and um, Cassie did mention that Barramundi score, which makes up part of that S3 score, is um, was higher than it has been. And of course, we have our net free zone um, now, which is probably showing that indication of, of the great trends in that. So, do you want to mention anything else about that, Cassie? Just, just um, yeah, yeah, great, great observations. Yeah. yeah. Right, well, thank you so much, everyone, for, um, for your questions. And if there's anything else, please let us know and we'll get in touch with you and respond to you as well. Um, 
Probably just to finish off today, I'd like to talk about, um, we've mentioned the urban, the stewardship rather, and the management practice within the basin. And I'd just like to um, mention a project that we're working on with um, the Office of the Great Barrier Reef for the Queensland Government. And some of the other report cards has or have already completed some of this process. Um, we're working very closely with our um, local councils um, and we've spoken with Councillor Kirkland and um, Dr Jason Plum here at Rockhampton Council um, to work towards looking at urban stewardship. Um, and so not focusing so much just on the ecosystem and water health, but actually having a closer look at the urban sector and what's happening in our urban areas um, that diffuse and point source um, I was going to say pollution, but it's not really pollution, it's management, isn't it, and how well that's managed. And so we're going to pilot that program um, in the next couple of months um, with Jason and um, see where we come from there and what the results look like and so on. But I wanted to highlight as well um, the stewardship report, which I know you've all got copies of. Um, one of the stories in there, which was really heartening to see, as um, Councillor Kirkland, Kirkland mentioned, was the upgrade of... Um, of a treatment plant in Rockhampton. So I've asked um, Jason Plum, who's the manager of the Fitzroy River Water at Rockhampton Regional Council. And also Jason was a founding member with the partnership. So it's nice to come full circle um, and has always been available for um, those really amazing things that he understands about water quality that we probably don't in that treatment process and so on as well. So if I can welcome um, Dr. Jason Plum to, to have say a few words. Jason, we'd like to come up here. And, yeah, if you can pop up here, that'd be great. I'll pop that slide up there while we're talking, um, but I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Nicole, have you got that? presentation for me. I've been given very strict time limits, so I'm <laughs> going to try and actually compress 10 years worth of, um, I guess, uh, initiatives and, and strategy around sewage treatment plants into about 10 minutes, hopefully. So, I'm just trying to uh, get that on. So uh, perhaps to start uh, off the presentations, a little bit, um, I guess, uh, leading of me to make that observation before around the improvements in estuary over the period of the report card. Uh, whilst that's obviously excellent to see, it's uh, from the point of view of the overall uh, improvement, it's also good to see that perhaps some of the efforts of, of council and other stakeholders in the area are contributing to some of that improvement. So, um, we'll so yeah, they can see that, Jason, but okay, you well, can't. Do you, do you want to come around here? Oh, I can do that. There? Yeah, yeah no one needs to see me. <laughs> All right, so, so moving fairly quickly ahead. Um, just a really very quick overview. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, sewerage schemes within this broader region. I'll give a bit of a breakdown of what the strategic plan was that was developed about nine to ten years ago and, and the journey thus far. Some project highlights for you, some very, very clear uh, performance improvements that we've been able to measure uh, and some of the next steps that we're already um, in progress with. Oops. I know, I'm not sure how clear that is on your screen, wherever you are, uh, but the various many red dots on the, uh, the aerial imagery there, actually, believe it or not, they're all individual uh, sewer access chambers um, connected to sewerage infrastructure. So you can see the what should be four little um, rectangular labels that say STP. So this is the, the bird's eye view of what Rockhampton and Gracemere looked like back in 2012. Um, there were four sewage treatment plants servicing that area, in excess of 80,000 equivalent persons or population. Uh, three of those sewage treatment plants released to the Fitzroy Estuary. One releases to land, um, either through land disposal or simply turf irrigation at Gracemere. Uh, and as the next slide shows, we um, had a whole licorice all sorts of infrastructure with um, quite significant variability with respect to age, design, condition, and obviously performance. So a lot of information in that table, but perhaps just look at the color coding at the bottom uh, in that final row where you can see perhaps the North Rockhampton sewage treatment plant in balance or on, on balance was in, in pretty reasonable condition. Um, the other three really weren't. And some of that was just a function of um, what was happening prior to council amalgamations and um, reflective of um, perhaps the, the lack of some investments in, in um, decades past. 
So it, it highlighted the need for uh, Fitzroy River Water and Council to get some very busy working on developing a, a strategic plan for sewage treatment plants. And so the copy of the report there on the right hand side is essentially the presentation of this uh, strategic plan to Council back in uh, 2014, I think, from memory. Uh, so uh, that, that sort of commenced probably about a 10 year program of multiple projects. I'll talk to you a little bit about some upgrade work already completed at the South Rockhampton Sewage Treatment Plant. Quite crucially, we were able to then decommission the West Rockhampton Sewage Treatment Plant. We made a key decision to keep the Gracemere Sewage Treatment Plant where it is, in, in part because that was a growth area for population and also it actually avoids some more uh, potential release to estuary. Some of the, um, the key Initiatives obviously are associated with increased recycled water use, upgrading some of our existing infrastructure, uh, but also continuing the usual asset management approach of making sure things are in good working order. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the focus on energy efficiency, but that's a, a little bit of a, a side issue from the point of view of the main topic today. So straight into a, a few of the project highlights. Um, the South Rockhampton Sewage Treatment Plant, um, which was constructed in 1983, that aerial photograph shows the plant prior to some of the upgrade works being completed. The schematic diagram beneath the aerial image actually just shows the uh, ultimate design change to something called a modified Lutzak editing a process, not particularly advanced technology, been around for many decades. All it involves is in this instance was the installation of fine bubble diffused aeration for much improved aeration performance. Um, the creation of some anoxic zones by dividing those two rectangular bioreactors in half. Um, that's required to obviously improve the ability to denitrify. Um, and obviously those process improvements um, uh, were aided by some improved mixing and we resulted, uh, resulted in some significant improvement in sludge settleability which obviously improves our uh, um, release of um, suspended solids to the estuary as well. So that was completed, um, about a $1.1 million project cost uh, for that upgrade. Um, but crucially, that upgrade at the South Rockhampton Sewage Treatment Plant enabled us to then turn this very tired 1960s trickling filter plant off, um, but only after the construction of about a four kilometre long um, rising main to enable the transfer of those sewage inflows from the West Rockhampton sewage treatment plant to the South Rockhampton sewage treatment plant. So that was approximately a, a one megalitre per day uh, inflow, which was able to be transferred across to the recently upgraded South Rockhampton sewage treatment plant. And you can see an indicative project cost there. Um, so at the same time, certainly in uh, the recent years from 2018 onwards, we've undertaken to do some significant renewals of the, our largest sewage treatment plant, which is the North Rockhampton Sewage Treatment Plant. It's now earmarked for uh, upgrading of its capacity from 50,000 EP to 75,000 EP to cater for growth in that northern catchment. Uh, the tender for that was advertised yesterday. Um, we expect that to be uh, perhaps up to about a $50 million uh, project um, overall, but um, quite importantly with respect to uh, water quality is the improvements that are expected through, again, the modernisation of the aeration system. Uh, and for the first time ever, one of the sewage treatment plants in Rockhampton will actually have the ability to remove phosphorus. So it's something we've never been required to do from the point of view of our environmental authority. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's uh, something we're looking to change. So what we've seen in terms of performance improvements, in terms of um, uh, improved um, or re reduced footprint, if you like, on the receiving environment, the South Rockhampton sewage treatment plant upgrades saw a 90% reduction in ammonia released to the estuary. Uh, we've seen up to 1,000 kilograms of reduction per week in total nitrogen released to the estuary. And again, this is since about 2015 onwards. Um, and all of that was able to be done with um, the decommissioning of the West Rockhampton sewage treatment plant at the same time, which was our poorest performing sewage treatment plant. Um, very nice to say at the same time, we uh, achieved about a 30% reduction in electricity usage um, through some of those design changes. Um, the photograph on the right is the fine bubble diffused aeration at that sewage treatment plant. 
overall and right across the uh, the Rockhampton, the two Rockhampton uh, sewage treatment plants that are remaining, we've seen a 24% reduction in total nitrogen released to the estuary. Um, and that comparison was from 1920 compared with 1819. And that was the lowest that we've uh, achieved in, in more than 10 years. We reuse 100% of our biosolids um, and uh, we've continued to lobby strongly for uh, funding support to, to continue some of these initiatives. So the next steps are pretty clear. We, we're continuing to focus on, um, I guess, avoiding discharging to the estuary through the uh, increased use of recycled water. Uh, a new scheme will be established very soon where we'll see up to four megalitres per day used for uh, different agricultural use. Uh, that's to be completed later this year. Uh, the North Rockhampton Recycled Water Scheme is actually up and running, but we uh, hope to soon commence supplying up to one megalitre a day of, of uh, recycled water to the Rockhampton Jockey Club. Uh, and as I mentioned, the, the upgrade of the North Rockhampton Sewage Treatment Plan will see some significant further improvements. And so the challenge, I suppose, for us is that, you know, can we, can we take the estuary from B to A? I'm not sure if it's quite possible to, to achieve an A, um, despite my efforts to suggest a, a different scoring scheme about <laughs> 10 years ago. But, um, we'll give it a crack, I think. So, um, uh, but thanks for your attention. Happy to answer any questions if there's some time. Thank you. Thank you. Jen. To be a very envious, we're very lucky. Um, any questions at all online? If anyone would like to pop something in, braveness there or anything in the room for now. I'm wondering how you um, remove phosphorus. What's the process for that? That particular process will be actually just relying on the, um, the presence or the inclusion of an anaerobic bioreactor to use a, a biological process, so a microbiological process called enhanced biological phosphorus removal. Yeah, okay. it's a it's a well established microbiological process that's yeah. been around for probably about thirty years. Yeah. Okay. Right. No, no more questions. Excellent. Congratulations. 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 Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. Well, we're running a little bit of time of, uh, ahead of time and ahead of the schedule, which is probably a good place to be, rather to be ahead than behind. I think at this stage. Um, if there's no other further comments or questions at the moment from the team, um, I'll hand over to Dan Yates to sort of close off our day. Um, and just I'd like to acknowledge everybody's input and support, and particularly the support of my team, as Eva mentioned. Um, without Cassie, Braden and Nicole here behind me, um, none of this would happen. So they keep my head in, in a clear space as well. So I really appreciate that input and appreciate the input from all of our partners who are online today um, as well. Um, Yes, I'll hand over to you today. It's hard to stop talking. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Lee. Oh, look, um, just to close out, everyone, now, as a chair, I'd like to congratulate the full team. You know, Eva, your team, absolute champions. Um, Lee, the group that you lead in, in uh, Rockhampton, awesome. Small group, but really punch above your weight and, and proud to be a part of or a small part of that group. Um, you've achieved so much as a group of individuals over the last 10 years. I've only been in it for the last four or five, so four years. So I'm proud to be part of it. Um, the report card's great from my perspective. You know, the Water Forum and the revised webinar, really good stuff. And the Fitzroy Basin First Nations map, you know, congratulations. I think they're all fantastic products um, that we can use and that they're available for the community to use as well. Um, have been part of the regional rent work and you know, the peripherals. Um, really looking excited to use that, but also to be part of it. Um, I think it will bring a new era to how we think and um, monitor the uh, the catchment. So looking forward to progressing that. Um, and thank you to all the partners and the management group. Um, your time is important. I know we're all very busy and I thank you all. Um, a special mention to our speakers today, uh, thank you. Um, and really, I just want to close out by saying really proud of the work that we do as a partnership team. Um, it is, again, truly um, uh, um, an excellent partnership to be part of. Everyone is equals in the group. And I encourage people to join uh, if you're not already a member or just go see the website or talk to Lee. Um, Till next time, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Dan.